Okay, today is the last lecture of new material for dynamics as well. Okay, um, it's on springs, mechanical oscillation. And uh, next week, we'll start with revision. We'll have two weeks worth of revision for dynamics because there's quite a lot of it. But just to remind you, and for those of you that weren't here, the exam is five que five, no, four questions, of which you have to do three. Okay? And there's no formula sheet on the exam, but you have to make your own formula sheet. And like I said, there's strict rules res regarding that. Okay? It's one single side of a sheet, okay? of a 1A4 sheet, has to be handwritten. Okay? No photocopies, has to be handwritten, has to be your own work. Okay? And you must hand it in in the exam. If you go over one side of a sheet, I'll be docking marks, okay? So make sure. Um, and, and if there isn't a sheet, I'll be docking marks as well because I'm, I'm expecting a sheet from every one of you. And you'll find the exam very difficult if you don't have a sheet with you, okay? One side of an A4 sheet, handwritten, and it must be handed in, okay? Um, but you can write whatever you want on it. It doesn't matter. You could write tutorial sheet answers. You could write equations. You could write an inspirational poem. You could draw pictures, whatever you want, okay? Um, if you think it will help, then write it on the sheet, okay? Um, I suggest you write small but still legible, okay? Because um, there's no magnifying glasses allowed either, okay? And like I said, no photocopies, so no thinking, oh, I'll write it on an A3 sheet and shrink it down. That's not allowed either, okay? That must be handwritten. Okay, so that's the exam. And like I said, next week and the week after we'll be doing revision, so I'll give a summary of the... Uh, of the topics that we covered in the lectures, okay? Just a short summary, going over the basics. And in the tutorial sheet sessions, I'll be preparing a specimen paper for you to work on, okay? Bear in mind, if you do look at the content collection in the library, okay? Um, last year's exam was a different format to this year's exam because it contained both stress and dynamics. This semester was obviously just dynamics, okay? Um, so last year's exam may not be representative, but I'll see what I can sort out in terms of specimen papers, okay, specimen questions for us to work on. So today, mechanical oscillations and springs, okay, I'm sure some of you spotted that I've got a little prop, but we'll talk about that in a bit. So talk about oscillations, what are oscillations, what do we mean, natural vibrations, simple harmonic motion, then we'll do a little section on springs, how do we determine the stiffness of a spring, combined stiffness of springs, which is probably a revision for you guys, and uh, then looking at the dynamics of the oscillation of a spring, okay? Then we'll look at the oscillation of a pendulum, hence the prop, okay? And the similarities between that and springs. And then we'll look at a couple of other considerations when talking about dynamics that are important, but we won't actually do much maths associated with that, um, about damping and resonance. That's all next year, level two dynamics, okay? For those of you that will be doing that. So, mechanical oscillations... Um, vibration can be a nuisance or they can be a, 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 a benefit, okay? Sometimes we want, um, we want oscillations. Now, the simplest sort of oscillation that we can get is a, is a mass and a spring, okay? So here we've got a mass on top of a spring and here we've got a mass rolling along the surface. Notice the wheels, so there's no friction and a spring attached to a wall. A ground, this is what we call grounded, okay? This spring is grounded. Okay, and essentially what happens is if you displace this mass over a certain distance, okay, you extend or contract the spring. Okay, and that's what you're doing by doing that work of moving the object, okay, you're doing work, and that work is then being stored in the spring as a strain energy or spring potential energy. And we all know the equation for that, that's one half kx squared, okay. And then what you do is when you release that spring, okay, that stored energy gets converted, um, into a kinetic energy because that's, that restored energy is going to try and restore the spring back to its equilibrium position. So it, it exerts a force on the, uh, on, the, um, on the mass, okay? The force we know is K times X, okay? And that force is going to try and pull it back to its equilibrium position. Now, what it does to do that is obviously it needs to convert that energy into a kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy builds up, okay, as the spring gets closer and closer to its equilibrium, okay, at which point at, at uh, zero equilibrium or the, the equilibrium position, the, the, forces, the 
mass is moving at its maximum velocity. Okay? Now, obviously, because it's got momentum, it's got a mass, it's got velocity, it overshoots the equilibrium position. And what it does is then the spring will start to exert a force, again, restoring it to its equilibrium position. And so the spring then starts to compress, again, converting kin that kinetic energy back into strain energy, strain energy okay, in the spring, oh, and that such that the spring will actually slow, the, the mass will actually slow down to rest, okay? and at which point the process repeats itself going in the other direction. And it will keep doing that if we're dealing with an, what's called non-conservative forces, okay, which means, essentially means there's no friction. It will keep doing that forever and ever and ever. Okay? Now, obviously, the useful, one useful application of springs is in the suspension of your car. Okay? Now, in car suspension, we have dampers. I'll talk about that later. But say you didn't have dampers, the moment you hit a bump, okay, the car would go down. Or, or up, depending on the, the shape of the bump, okay? And, but it would keep on oscillating up and down, up and down, okay? And it would never die out. Well, it would die out after a long while, okay? Which is why we have dampers. But I'll talk about that in a bit. Anyway, so that's essentially the simplest form of oscillation, a spring and a mass. And so if the spring is in equilibrium position, the mass will not move, okay? That means we're talking about the relaxed length of the spring. So you have a spring, you bought it from a shop, say, or whatever, that's the relaxed length of the spring. The moment you exert a, a displacement change on that spring, the spring will then exert a force on whatever you've tried to, you know, what, you know between, will exert a force trying to restore it to, to that equilibrium position. Okay, so if a mass is displaced, to stretch or compress the spring, when released, the system will oscillate. Okay, now the important thing to know about this is that it will oscillate at a particular frequency, and I will cover that in a second. Okay. So we can talk about conservation of energy. As I said, you've got the strain energy and kinetic energy. And essentially, the mass, the sum of those two together, okay, the elastic potential energy or the spring energy or the strain energy. Strain, we know, is the change in distance, okay, over the original distance. Plus the kinetic energy is a constant, okay, with no damping and with a, a natural oscillation, natural vibration. This is, holds true, okay. And so a vibration may thus be regarded as a continuous energy conversion process. We talked about energy um, in lecture six, and we talked about how they convert between one and the other. We have potential energy, kinetic energy. There's all sorts of other energies, sound energy, heat energy, etc. Okay, And a lot of those, they can be converted between each other. Work is one of the ways we can convert between them. Okay, And if we want to use energy methods with springs, then we can use this as an energy method, okay? We talked about energy methods. Now, when we're dealing with very simple systems, okay, the spring will oscillate in what we call simple harmonic motion, okay? Or simple harmonic oscillation, SHM or SHO, okay? They're one and the same thing. And a simple harmonic oscillation is one that is firstly periodic, okay? As in, it will repeat itself, okay? We'll talk about sinusoidal motion in a bit, but essentially it will repeat itself. It doesn't have a different, you know, it's not random, it's periodic, very nice and timely. It's undriven, okay, so there's no external forces acting on it. We'll talk about them in a second as well. Okay, no external forces acting on it. And it's also undamped, so it does not decay over time. That's what defines simple harmonic motion or simple harmonic oscillation. And we can look at that graphically Okay, we've got a vector OQ rotating about its center O with a constant angular velocity omega n. Okay, so here's vector OQ. It started out here at time equals zero, and it's rotating around the circle. Okay, now if you project this onto a line, okay, you get this point P, and as this rotates around, okay, point P will move up and down. Okay, and if we project point P onto a time line, okay, so this is time in that axis, this is x of t, or position of terms of, uh, with respect to time, you end up getting this line. And that's what we call, what's that line? It's a sine wave, or sinusoidal wave, okay? Sinusoidal response. And so that's what you get when you rotate this round, okay? You, get a, uh, uh, you project that onto a line, you get an up and down motion. And that's, if you imagine you had a spring hanging from the ceiling, I deflected it, I let go, it would move up and down um, as p would move up and down the bc line, okay? And if I, say, had a, a big, uh, like a conveyor belt, 
vertical conveyor belt, and I had a, a, a paintbrush or something, and I moved the conveyor belt as this mo thing was moving up and down, it would produce a sine wave. Okay. Now, there's a few things about sine waves that we need to know. This is the period, okay, which is the time from for one complete oscillation. So not just not just that bit, and not just that bit, but from there up, back down, and back up again. Okay. Or you can go from trough to trough, or you can go from peak to peak, whatever. Okay. But that value there, t, is the period of the sine wave. Okay. So that's that's how we define simple harmonic motion. Okay. And as we said, this is a sine wave or a cosine wave, a sinusoidal response. And so a solution to this wave, okay, the, the equation for that, that, this is the way we analyze them, okay, a solution to this could be the equation that looks like this. X of t is the amplitude multiplied by the cosine of omega n t plus phi, okay? Now, what are these symbols? Well, A is what we know is the amplitude of oscillation, okay? So I've got my spring oscillating up and down, okay? The amplitude is from equilibrium position to a peak, or the equilibrium position to a trough. Okay. Omega n is the natural angular frequency. We'll talk about that in a second. Units of radians per second. Okay. And, and phi here is the, what we call the phase angle measured in radians. Okay. Now we'll talk about phase angle in just a little bit. We define this based on initial conditions. Okay. But a is the amplitude of oscillation. And omega n is what we call the natural angular frequency of a system. Now, the next table, okay, in your notes, uh, okay, and on this slide, um, basically lists the position, velocity, and acceleration <coughs> of points, okay, at the center of oscillation and the extremities of oscillation for simple harmonic motion. Now, the table that I'm going to show you has two more things that you need to add to your notes because I didn't include them, okay? Um, it was a mistake. I should have included them. But these general cases, you'll need to know them to solve the problems in, your, in the exercise book, okay? Um, so for velocity, you've got x dot, obviously it's velocity, is omega n times the square root of a squared minus x squared. And the acceleration is merely omega squared n times by x. Okay, so you need to add them to your book for you to be able to solve the problems. Okay, has everybody got them down? Right, so at the center of oscillation, okay, obviously we're at the equilibrium position, so the distance, the extension x is zero, okay? But we know that at the center of oscillation, if something's oscillating backwards and forwards, its speed at the center is the maximum velocity, okay? And if we plug in into this equation, x equals zero, okay, you get omega n times by a, a squared, but square rooted, so omega n times a will give you the maximum velocity. Okay, and obviously acceleration, that's zero because obviously here's the acceleration. X is zero, so x double dot must be also be zero. So there's no acceleration at that point. Okay, so this is at the centre of oscillation, at the extremities of oscillation. So we're talking about either end. Okay, obviously a x is going to be your amplitude. A, <coughs> the velocity is zero because the spring has brought it, it to a rest. So the kinetic energy and the spring constant. Are equal to oh uh, well they've um, they've balanced each other out okay and the acceleration is also going to be a maximum okay if you plug in a in for here for x you get omega n squared times a and that will be your maximum acceleration so although the thing stopped okay it's not moving you've got a maximum acceleration it's just about to start moving okay so that's the extremities of the oscillation and so these equations you'll need to solve some of the problems in the problem sheets okay. So, what are we talking about? We've, we've identified period, okay, which we said is T, which is the time for one cycle of oscillation, okay, up and down or peak to peak, okay, whatever you want to, however you want to time it, okay. Now, frequency is the number of cycles in a second, okay, so 
period measures the number of seconds for one oscillation, okay, and frequency measures the number of oscillations in one second. Okay, so it's in, they're inverse of each other. Okay? And angular frequency okay, is essentially that angle of that circle, okay, the angular or circular frequency of that, of that frequency. Okay? Now, how do we relate between these? This may have been revision for you. I'm not sure. Okay? But essentially, we have the period. That equals 1 over f. Like I said, they're an inverse of each other. So f equals 1 over t. Okay? So say I had a period of half a second. The frequency would be 1 divided by a half. Okay, so we'd have 2 hertz frequency. Okay? And then to get uh, omega from that, you multiply the frequency by 2 pi. 2 pi f gives you omega, which is the natural frequency. So if I had, if I had 2 hertz frequency, then I'd have a natural frequency of 4 pi radians per second. Okay? And so these are the relationships that you want to remember. Okay? If omega e equals 2 pi f, okay, then obviously 1 over f equals 2 pi over omega. And here we've got omega equals 2 pi f, which is 2 pi over t. Because obviously if we replace f with 1 over t, you get 2 pi over t. So this is the relationship. They're, more, they're explained a bit more explicitly in your notes. Okay? Now, omega is an important property of oscillations. We saw that in the uh, equation... It's a fundamental part of what happens, okay? So we need to look at omega. And this subscript n, okay, indicates that we're talking about the natural frequency, okay? So this is the frequency of a natural vibration, i.e. it's following simple harmonic motion. There's no dri driving force, there's no damping force, okay? We're talking about the natural frequency. There are other things called damp natural, damp frequency, okay? But we're not dealing with that, we're dealing with just the natural frequency, so I'll skip through them again. Right. Springs. Now, you may have seen this uh, picture before in your notes. Essentially, when you pull a spring, you extend a spring, okay, it's st the moment you start to pull it, it produces a force in the opposite direction, opposing your motion, okay? So I extend the spring from between x1 and x2. I get a pull force, okay? That pull is a force. And we know that that force is going to be proportional to the change in extension. Okay, the further I pull the force, the further the greater. Sorry, the further I pull the spring, or extend the spring, the greater the force is. If I extend the spring by x amount, okay, I get a, a force that's related to that x amount. If I pull it by three x, okay, three times greater, I get a three times greater force pulling back, and so on. Okay. Now there is a limit to this. If obviously, depending on the spring, if I pull it beyond a certain point, it'll start to deform. Plastically, okay, we go into stress and as I, you let go and it won't come back to its original thing. But they're not ideal springs. We're dealing with just ideal springs here, okay. So we put a force, we, get a, we pull the spring, extend the spring, we get a force trying to restore it to its original length. And whenever this relationship holds between F and X, okay, this is referred to as Hooke's Law. Now, did you all hear of Hooke's Law in, when you're dealing with stress? Yeah. So you should all be quite familiar with what's going on. A spring is essentially just like a beam or a, you know, a rod or something, okay? But it's obviously much, much springier than a beam, okay? So it's the same thing. Okay, and by hanging different... So imagine I had a spring hanging from a mass, now hanging from a position, okay? I hung masses on the bottom. By looking at the extension that we got, we, knew that we know the force, that's mg, and looking at the extension that we get, we can work out the value for k, which is the stiffness of the spring. Okay, you get a straight line, ideally. Okay, with an ideal string, you get a straight line. And essentially, that slope of that line will be your value for k. Now, there's another way to determine k, and this is dynamically. Okay. Um, again, we've got the system. Equilibrium position is when x is zero, okay, and we extend it to position x. We have a mass of m, okay, which we know, and we let go of the mass, and the spring will start to oscillate backwards and forwards, okay. And there will be a period associated with that oscillation, as we discussed, okay, and that period, t, is defined as 2 pi times the mass over the stiffness of the spring, okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to derive this equation for you because it's very simple. 
Um, but, the, but bear in mind that the interesting and non-intuitive thing about this is that this, does, this period doesn't matter how far you pull the spring out. Okay, it doesn't matter how far you pull the spring out. If, you could, if, the, if the spring could support it, you could extend it five times as far, okay, and the period would stay the same as if you expended it one-fifth as far, okay? So it doesn't matter. And the same with a pendulum, but I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so M is the mass and K is the spring constant. So we have this equation for period. Now, how do we get, how would, how do we get there? Okay, well, first off, let's talk about combined springs. You'll need to know this. Okay, so these are what known as springs in parallel. Uh, this you probably covered in physics or maths or something, okay, at school. Springs in parallel. To get the total spring constant, the effective spring stiffness, you add them together, okay? So the effective spring stiffness, Ke, is just basically you add up the springs. These both, both of these systems are springs in parallel, okay? So every spring you add to, uh, say I had a mass or platform, I had four springs holding it up, every spring I add to it will increase the stiffness, so you just add them up, okay? Springs in series, okay, well here's a, Two springs in series with a mass on the end. Now, for this time, every spring I add, okay, will add to the flexibility of that um, thing. So, in fact, the stiffness goes down. And so what we've got is we've got an inverse relationship. So 1 over Ke equals the inverse of K1 plus the inverse of K2 plus so on, inverse of Kn. Okay? And so we can say the effective spring stiffness is all of this divided by 1 okay, to the power of minus 1. And so... When you've got springs in series, it's less stiff. And when you've got springs in parallel, it's more stiff. So, how do we get to that period, that equation for period? Well, let's look at the oscillation of the spring. If we apply Newton's second law to that mass, okay, we've got MA, mass times acceleration, equals, <coughs> minus, uh, equals minus Kx. That's a, that, that force is minus Kx. Okay, MX equals minus Kx. And we can rearrange that to say mx double dot, okay, plus kx equals zero. Okay, that's very simple. And this is a, a differential equation. And what we then do is we divide by m, and we end up with x double dot equals k over m times x equals zero. Now, this very simple equation is one of the most fundamental equations in all of physics, okay? And you'll be sick and tired of it by the end of your second year. Okay, but it's fundamental. This is the basics of all, all vibrations. Any, any, any other things, if you start to drive it or add damping or that sort of stuff, it's just an extension of this equation. This is fundamental. Okay? X double dot equals K over M times X equals zero. Okay? Absolutely fundamental to all physics. And mechanical engineering is essentially applied physics. So it's fundamental to us as well. <coughs> so, simple harmonic oscillation, we saw that the function of that sine, uh, x of t equals a cosine omega t plus phi, okay? And so we use this as a trial function to solve for that equation, okay? Now, you've done differential equations in maths, I know that, okay? So you could probably solve this yourself, but we'll go through and solve it anyway. Here's our trial function. Obviously, to solve it, we need to work out what x dot and x double dot is. And so we go through the motion... As we said, A is the furthest distance from X to X equals zero, measured in metres, and the oscillation will repeat itself, okay? Two pi is one cycle. And so we substitute, I say equation one into equation one, I don't mean that, obviously. Um, we've got this equation, we take the first derivative, obviously that's going to be minus A sine, okay? Because obviously <coughs> cosine, you differentiate cosine with respect to time, you get a minus sine. Okay, so we get A, omega, because the omega comes out, sine of omega t plus phi, okay? And here, it's x double dot, we differentiate it again. Okay, well, the omega comes out again, which is why we have omega squared, and obviously the sine flips to cosine. So we've got minus A, omega squared, cosine, omega t plus phi. And you can see that here we've got A, cosine, omega t plus phi, and here we've got A, cosine, omega t plus phi, with a minus omega squared. So you can essentially say that x double dot equals minus omega squared x of t. Now, if you remembered what was in the table, you'll see that that, that is the same thing, okay? So, 
We then substitute these two things, okay, x t and x of t, into our equation. Okay, you end up here. And if you can see what we've got, we've got x of t here and x of t here. We divide by x of t, and we end up with omega squared equals k over m. Okay, so omega, the natural frequency, is the square root of k over m. Again, this is fundamental. Okay, fundamental. Okay, we need to know, you need to know that. You may find it very useful in the future. And so, we know that the relationship between omega and t, we've got that relationship. t equals uh, 2 pi divided by omega. And so, if we do 2 pi divided by this value, okay, we end up with t equals 2 pi times root m over k. Okay? That's where that comes from. Now, we talked about phi and in initial conditions, so I'm going to do a little example now. Okay, so there's my book. I've got a pen. So the example in the book it says, using the system illustrated in figure 9.5. So we've got a... So this has a spring constant k. And we know that omega equals root k upon m. Okay. And the period we know is 2 pi times by the root of m upon k. Now we're given some values. Omega. Well, we know we're not given omega. We've got k, which is 10 newtons per meter. We've got the mass which is 0 0.1 kilograms, okay? And so we can find omega. Omega is root 10 upon 0 0.1. Well, 10 upon 0 0.1 is 100. Square root it, you get 10 radians per second. Okay, so that's 10 radians per second. Okay, and t, we know is 2 pi times by m divided by k. So that's 2 pi times by 0 0.1 divided by 10. And so we get 0 0.628 seconds. Okay. Now, what I'm doing with this, okay, is there's two ways you can you can start a system oscillating. Okay. You can extend it and release it. That will start the system oscillating. The other way to start a system oscillating is to just give it a velocity. Okay. So I've got my spring. I just give it a nudge, which gives it a velocity, which starts the system oscillating. Okay. Now this example. You can see x equals 0 in the notes. It says that and t equals 0, OK? And v dot, sorry, v equals uh, minus 3 meters per second. So what I've done is I've set up my system, OK? Equilibrium position, OK? And I've given it a nudge. So I've got initial velocity. And so we can say x of t, we know is a cosine omega t plus phi. Okay, that was the standard equation. And we know that at time equals zero, x of t is zero. And so we've got a cosine omega times by zero plus phi. Okay, so that's going to be a cosine of phi. Now, any system that's oscillating will have an amplitude, so that can't be zero. So for this term to equal zero, a cosine of phi, a can't be zero, so cosine of phi must be zero. Okay, so we know cosine of phi is zero. And what values of phi can mean the cosine is zero? Anybody? No, cosine, what values of phi must cosine be zero? 90 degrees, yeah? What about 270 degrees? It's also zero, yeah? So we can say that phi must be pi by 2 or 3 pi by 2. Obviously, any more multiple of that will end up being just you know, going around the circle more than once. OK, so there's phi. So we've got that value. OK, we've got omega. What about a? 
Well, we know that um, x dot at time equals 0 equals minus 3. So that equals that. And we know that x dot, if you remember, x is a cosine omega t plus phi. x dot times by t is minus a omega cosine omega t plus phi. Okay? Can you see that? Yep. And so we know, we know this is minus a omega, sorry, that's sine, sine omega t plus phi. Now, we've got, we're dealing with zero, so that's a. We know omega is 10. We've got sine of <coughs> zero plus pi by two. Okay, that's that value there. Okay, well, sine of 90 degrees is... Sine of 90 degrees is 1. one. Right, okay. So that value there, we know that's 1. Okay, so we've got minus 3 equals minus 10a. So therefore, a must equal 0 0.3. Okay, so there's our amplitude. And so we end up with x of t equals 0 0.3. So we've got a cosine of 10t plus pi divided by 2. Okay, so there's our solution. That's when we choose phi equals pi by 2. If you choose 3 pi over 2, it's exactly the same, except you just get minus 0 0.3 cosine 10t plus 3 pi over 2. It's exactly the same solution. If you plotted those two things, they'd be exactly the same. You're just shifting the, the, the cosine wave, okay, inversing it and adding, 90, adding 180 degrees to it. Is that a question? No? Not a question. Right. Okay, so that's the motion of a spring, okay? This is all about oscillation of a spring. Now, there are similarities when we're talking about pendulums. Okay, let me put this PC back on. Has everybody got this? No? I'll leave it up. One thing I'll talk about just before we move on to pendulums is this thing period, okay? Now it's quite, you can see that period depends on the mass and depends on the spring stiffness, okay? And it's quite easy to understand why this makes sense, okay? If you've got a, if you've got a spring and a mass, okay, if you extend the spring, the force being created is completely independent of the mass, yeah? Okay, the force is dependent upon the extension and the stiffness of the spring, okay? And so all the spring knows about whatever's putting on it, okay? It doesn't know anything about the mass. All it knows is it's saying, I'm too long, I want to go back to equilibrium position, okay? And so if you double the mass, okay, that force is constant, extension, you know, it's just kx, okay? The force is constant. If you double the mass, then the acceleration must go down, which means that the period must be increased, which is why we've got mass in this equation, Okay? And so it makes sense that mass is in there. It makes sense that stiffness is in there because obviously the stiffness will change the amount of force being pulled on that mass. Okay? So that's why M over K. And like I said, the extension doesn't matter. If you pull the spring out five times, okay, the mass goes up five times. Sorry, the, the mass doesn't go up five times. The mass is the same, but the force goes up five times. And so the, your restoring force is just five times greater. So that force is going to give it a greater acceleration and so the time that it takes for one oscillation is completely independent of how far you pull it out, okay? You pull it out five times as far, it'll just go backwards and forwards much faster, okay? But the time it takes for that one oscillation will be the same as if you pulled it out a little bit, okay? Because the force is smaller when you pull it out a little bit. It's all to do with that stiffness of the spring. 
Right, let's move on to oh, main menu, PC. Okay, so move on to pendulums. So we've got a pendulum. I've got a pendulum here as well. Okay. And it's got a length of L here. Okay, that's the length of the pendulum from the pivot point down to the mass. Okay, on the bottom we've got a mass. And obviously on the mass there are two forces. There was an example of this in chapter 3. What are the forces on the mass on the bottom of the pendulum? There's two forces. We've got obviously the mass of the mass on the bottom, you know, the, the gravitational force on the mass. And then we've got the tension in that rod. In this case, the rod, that could be a piece of string. Ideally, we'd want that to be massless. Okay? The angle it makes with the vertical is our theta. That angle is theta. Okay? And so we can decompose T into uh, X and Y components, T sine theta, T cosine theta. And let's do Newton's second law on this. Okay? So there's our small version of it. Newton's second law in the X direction, or MX double dot, uh, the only force acting on this is the t in the x direction, so we've got minus t sine theta. And sine theta we know is opposite over adjacent, uh, sorry, opposite over hypotenuse. And so that distance there is x, and obviously the hypotenuse there is l. So it's minus t times by x divided by l. Okay? That's in the x direction. In the y direction, we've got my double dot, so the motion in this direction equals t cosine theta minus mg. Okay, so we've got the vertical component of T minus the mass component. Okay, my double dot equals T cosine theta minus mg. Now, what we've got here is two coupled differential equations. Now, unless you're, a, you're particularly um, masochistic, um, you, won't, you don't want to solve this. Okay, it's very, very challenging and far too much time consuming. We don't, we're engineers, we don't really worry too much about approximations. And so we make some approximations, okay? We use what's called small angles, okay? Now, small angles has a few implications for this problem. If we assume small angles, we can say that cosine of theta equals one, okay? Now, how do I define small angles? I'm saying here, theta is much, much less than one radian. What do I mean? Well. Let's say that theta is 5 degrees. Cosine of 5 degrees is 0.996. Okay? Cosine of 10 degrees is 0.985. So you're only 1.5% out okay, with a 10 degree angle for theta. So that's a pretty good approximation. Obviously, if I took it to 90 degrees, yeah, obviously cosine of 90 degrees is very different from 1. Okay? But 5 or 10 degrees... It's close enough. We don't really worry too much. Okay? The other thing that we can say, if I go back to the picture, okay, this excursion in the y direction, okay, if this is a small angle, that excursion is going to be very small. And again, we can say for 5 degrees, we can work out that excursion. It's 4%. Okay? For 5 degrees. For 10 degrees, that excursion is only 9% of the excursion in the x direction. And so, again, we choose not to worry about it. So the other approximation we can make, we say cosine of theta equals 1, and we can also say the excursion in the y direction is negligible compared to the excursion in the x direction, okay? Hence, y double dot equals 0. And so we can apply these equations, okay? So this is in the y direction, equation 1, like I said, excuse these things, okay? So y double dot equals zero, so we've got t minus mg, and like I said, t cosine of theta, that equals one, so we've got t minus mg, so t must equal mg. We can make that assumption. And then you stick that into this equation, okay, and we end up with m x double dot equals mg times x over l, okay, rearranged, divide by m, we end up getting x double dot equals g over l times x equals zero. Now, this should look familiar, sort of. It's exactly the same as with a spring, except that in the spring we had k over m. Here we've got g over l. And so we can make the same assumptions about the various properties. We can have the same equation to solve it. We've got the same value for omega. Well, again, that's just g over l, or the square root of g over l. 
and the period is 2 pi times L over G. And so, I've got my spring here. We'll do a little experiment, okay? I've got a tape measure and a stopwatch. And so I can measure L. I know what M is. Let's measure L. I make that about 70 centimetres. So we'll do a little uh, experiment. Let me move to the visualiser. You don't have to write this down if you don't want to. So pendulum. L is 0.7 metres. Okay? And so we can make a prediction about the period. T equals 2 pi root G over L. And so I'll make a prediction of the, the period. I've got my calculator here. 2 pi times by the square root of 9.81 divided by 0.7. Sorry? You're right, it's L over G. 2 pi, yep, L over G. There we are, that makes sense. Okay, so... Point seven, nine point eight one. Okay, here we go. So one point six seven seconds, or six eight seconds even. Okay. Now my measurement, I reckon that was about plus or minus, let's say half a centimeter. My pen is starting to fail. Bring it back up. Okay. 1.68 seconds is the period, okay? So 10 periods, 10 T, is going to be 1.16, uh, 16.8 seconds, okay? Now, I'm going to measure 10 periods with my stopwatch, okay? And I reckon we're going to be, so this is the prediction. My observation, I reckon I'm prob probably quick enough to be within 0.1 of a second, Okay, so we'll take a small angle. It won't work if I do it up here. We're dealing with small angles, remember? And so if I start it as, it as it comes back and stops at this side, you can count with me. So I'll let it go, and then we'll start it. Ready? Go. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, nine, ten. Sixteen point two two seconds. So I'm a little bit out. <laughs> okay, my timing isn't absolutely correct. But sixteen point two two is pretty good. Like I said, I didn't incorporate that um that uh irregularity or that, that problem, okay? But 16.22 is not too bad. If I did it more, I may get closer and closer to the answer. Now, what about if I change the length of this pendulum? The mass is the same. It's just the length that's changed. Let's take the measurement here. So from the centre, we're about 19 centimetres. So L this time. So T, we can do the same thing again. Zero point eight seven. So ten should be eight point seven seconds. We could do the same thing. Here we are, put it out. Ready? Go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Not too bad. Observation ten T equals ten point nine. Okay, now, can you think of a reason why I'm slightly out? Sorry? Yeah, exactly. This rod isn't massless. Okay, if the rod was massless or if it was a piece of string, obviously this would be a bit more accurate. Anyway, it shows you that the mass has no bearing on the 
period, okay? I could hang a pendulum from the ceiling. It would have quite a long period because it's quite long, okay? But if I, it was a small mass, it would take however long, X amount to swing, okay? If I hung on the bottom, it would take the same amount of time to swing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter on the angle. That has no bearing. If I was up here, it's the same sort of time, okay? And it doesn't matter how much mass is on the bottom. It's purely based on the length of that mass of string. Okay, so... Quickly run through the last considerations. Okay, all real systems are deemed non-conservative, okay, as in they involve friction. So what you end up with is a, you end up with a uh, damped oscillation, okay? So your oscillation would be like this, okay? But obviously it's going to slow down. The amplitude will reduce, okay? And we can measure those amplitudes and the ratio of those amplitudes will be a logarithmic decrement, okay? Now, resonance. Imagine you're at a playground. You're pushing a child on a swing, okay? And if you time your pushes with the natural frequency of the swing, okay, obviously the amplitude is going to increase. And this is what we know is resonance. I can do it on here, okay? If I push it, okay, if my frequency of pushing is not in line with a... Uh, with um, the thing, okay, it doesn't increase. But if I make sure that my pushes are the same every time, it's always getting a bit unstable. Okay, pushes are the same. You can see that it would increase, okay, more and more and more. And that's what we know as resonance. And that occurs in all sorts of situations, okay. Some ways it's useful, some ways it's a nuisance. You generally want to avoid it, okay, if you want something to remain stable. Now, a prime example of this, okay, well, a benefit is wave energy devices. Imagine something bopping up and down. You want to extract the most amount of energy, so you want that bobbing up and down to be matching the, reson the natural frequency of the system. Although, you don't want it to do something like this. Now, in the States, there was a bridge that was built over the Tacoma Narrows um, River, okay, Tacoma River, and... Uh, when they built it, they didn't take into account resonance. Now, I've got a little movie. Um, we won't show it all. You may have seen it. Okay. So this is opening day. I'll make it full screen. Okay. And four months after it opened, they started to notice that it was vibrating a bit. Okay. Due to the wind. It's only 40 mile an hour wind, but look at the bridge. You can see there's a car here, and there's a chap that's just got out of his car. And in that car was a dog called Hoppy. Okay? The dog was too scared to get out of the car, so he stayed in the car. The chap came back. You can see the chap. Can you see him? He's trying to walk along the white line to make sure he doesn't uh, fall over. He's finding it quite tough. Okay? But the car's stuck out on the bridge, and you can see this oscillation. It's pretty, pretty dramatic, isn't it? And this is all due to resonance. The wind produces a variety of frequencies, okay? It just so happened that one of the frequencies that it produced at 40 miles an hour caused this vibration. Okay, so he's trying to walk along this straight line. He's having difficulty. Look at this. It's incredible, isn't it? That's just caused by wind. Yeah, this is a steel structure with steel cables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is a concrete roadway. It's bending like that. It's, sorry? You wouldn't have thought so. Anyway, it gets worse and worse and worse. Let's see when it's a... Uh... So we'll move along a bit. Look at this. It's phenomenal. And then... Let's move it along a bit. Collapse of the centre span. What happens now is it gets so much that basically things start breaking and you end up with a collapse of the bridge. This is the danger of resonance, not understanding what's going on, okay? And all sorts of things can happen like that, okay? So, that's resonance. So, a quick summary. Um, so, Single degree of freedom, undamped system, simple harmonic motion. 
This is the equation for simple harmonic motion. Okay? We've got our general cases. Don't forget that those two equations are in addition to what you've got in your notes. Okay? Relationship between period, frequency, and omega, natural frequency. Springs in parallel, springs in series. Okay? That should be revision for you. Relationship between those properties. We've covered that. Okay? Now, for a spring, we've got this equation, which is fundamental. The natural frequency is root k over upon m. Don't forget that equation. And the period is 2 pi times 1 over m, the 1 over omega. For a spring, it's exactly the same type, type of problem. Okay. Thank you very much. See you next week.